This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you would, turn in your Bibles, Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, and this is our text as we conclude this series. Joshua chapter 10, verse 1, Now it came to pass that when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king. So he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities. And because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty, Therefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. And therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibeon and made war against it. And we had, uh, this is part four of conquering challenging relationships. Conquering challenging relationships. If you live long enough, you're going to deal with some challenging relationships, with some cantankerous people. Uh, there are some people that will make you wonder, God, why did you make them? Why did you make them and why did you even put them in my region of the world? Why? Why? But these are, these are five distinct kings that really represent five different categories or types of uh, spirits or people challenging relationships with which we deal. Uh, life is all about relationships. You, no man as, is an island unto himself, as John Doan said. But we are a part of a, of a larger uh, world, a, a network of, of mutuality. We are connected one to another, whether you realize it or not. And uh, we are not really separated by by oceans, we are still connected by humanity, that we are all creatures made in the image and after the likeness of God. But I want you to notice these, these five, and we're going to summarize them here. Uh, uh, Adonai Zedek, as you know, means Lord of Justice. That means Lord of Justice. This is that relationship that you have with the spirit that always tries to, to justify you is self-justification. This is the enemy of what we would consider to be self-justification. And the problem with this is that whenever you try to justify yourself, it means that you strip away God's ability to justify you because you have justified yourself. This is a Donizetic. This, all of these relationships are relationships that really try to replace who God is in our life and what he does for us. See, whenever you allow another human being to take the position and place of God in your life, you're setting up an idol. And God is going to cause that idol to fall. You can set that up and, and think that this man is all of that or this woman is all of that, but God will let that image fail. He will allow them to disappoint you. And if you live with them long enough, you will discover this is not a God. In fact, you'll start blaming the devil. And then the name Hoam, uh, it means Jehovah protects the multitude. Uh, Hoam really, you know, he's a, he's a, a Donny Zedek is, is from Hoam. It, 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 uh, Hoam, it, it's, it's really like a cover-up, a cover-up. That's, that's what this, this is. This is something that tries to cover things up. Uh, a multitude is usually emblematic of a great number of people or a great number of sins. Uh, Hoam uh, is the king of Hebron. He's the king of Hebron, which is the seat of association. Um, it is interesting that 
The third challenging relationship that we deal with is Pyram. And Pyram essentially means wildness, wildness. Uh, there are some folks that know people that have been touched by this spirit, wildness. Uh, the people that have been touched by this, we call them wild and out. They're wild folks, but it's, it can all be summarized in that word wildness. And when you really see wildness manifested in people, I want you to know that there is a soul behind wild people that is hungry. Because wildness, really, I found over the years, it is a search for security. It is a search for self-worth, and it is a search for significance. People that are wilding out have not found their security in who they are. They've not found their self-worth. That's why they put themselves on sale. And when you really feel cheap, you give it away free. But it is a search for self-worth. It is a search for significance. It is a search for security. Security. They're looking for something. Wild folks are always looking for something that they don't feel satisfied with in and of themselves. It's a search for something. So whenever you see folks as wilding out, they are prime candidates for ministry. They are prime candidates for ministry. It's the spirit of Pyram. This is a Pyram spirit that produces wildness in folks where they'll do all kinds of crazy, freaky things. And they, they, are, they are searching for security. They are searching for self-worth. They are searching for significance. For significance. And even if that means just enjoying the moment, that, oh, this feels terrific for the moment. They are searching for significance and worth and security. But people are often wild because they have unmet needs. They are wild because they have unmet needs. There's nothing more that makes us susceptible to a spirit of Pyram than having unmet needs in your life. And then uh, Pyram is, is the king of Jarmuth, uh, which actually means elevation. And that has reference to the high-mindedness and the pride of individuals. But this next challenging relationship, the one that we come to here, is King Jophia. Jophia is essentially summed up in the word pride. This is pride. And uh, there are some people that have a really, really strong relationship with pride. But it's a challenging and a difficult relationship that we must deal with because uh, this relationship with Jophia represents pride, not of what you have, but of what you know. This is about what you know. You'd be surprised. I don't know whether you, you know how uh, you can tell oftentimes well-educated people, you go in an academic environment, they, they carry their heads in a certain way. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you know that sort of stiff neck that when people get arrogant because the pride is not about what they have, it's about what they, it's about what they know. It's about what they know. It can just, so you don't have to have a whole lot. Uh, there are a lot of teachers. They don't, it's not that they make so much money. It's not that they are the richest people. But there's, there's, this, there's this pride. Not over what they have, but over what they, it's over what they know. But the danger with it is that pride goes before a fall. It goes before a fall. So whenever you see a relationship with, with Jophia, it's setting you up to take you down. It's a setup to take you down. Because pride goes before a fall. The great sin of pride is that it lifts the person up. Um, it, it, rather, it's, it's not that it lifts the other person up, but that it presses other people down. See, there's nothing with your being uh, lifted uh, and made to feel lofty, but there is a problem when you do so at the expense of pushing other people down. You know, when you want to be on top because you've stepped on other people, that's the problem. That's the problem. The problem is pressing other people down. See, pride is always comparing, saying, I'm better than you. I know more than you. I have a bit bigger, higher position than you. I've got more stuff than you. I've got more toys than you. I've got more money than you. I've got more education than you do. And they develop their sense of pride over what they have. And sometimes it's really even not because of all of their hard work. 
Certain things were given to them and that they may not have even qualified for and they have the unmitigated gall to have pride over something that they didn't even earn. And so this is that spirit of Jaffia. Uh, pride is, is devoid of love for others. Because pride, if you really want to understand the, the, the whole spirit behind pride, take a look at it, P-R-I-D-E. Looks right in the center. You, you ever notice that, P-R-I-D-E? You, you want to notice the heart of things, go to the heart of it. You want to know the heart of sin, S-I-N. You ever notice that? You want to notice the heart of a lie, L-I-E. People lie to protect themselves, to protect their own image, to protect what they have. They, 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 they lie, they sin. No, notice what's right in the middle of it, testimony, testimonies. And sometimes they act like they're testifying about God, but it's really about how God used me. And so if you want to know the nature of a lot of things, go to the center of it. Go, go to the center and you'll see that pride is, is really about thinking about your, your, yourself. Humility, on the other hand, as a, as, a, as a contrast with pride, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. And there's a huge difference. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. It is where you realize that when God placed you in the earth, this is not about you just being here to see how much fun you can have and to see how much stuff you can accumulate. That's not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is actually a life of service. Why do you think God gives you gifts? Do you realize that your gifts are not to serve you? Your gifts are always to serve other people. Have you ever noticed people that are like a cosmetologist, they have the gift of doing other folks' hair, and sometimes they don't have to take care of their own. You know why? Because they've been doing it for everybody else all day long, and they just, I mean, they're like, they just roll out the bed. And then you find people that cook professionally, and then they come home and they don't want to cook. You know why? Because their gift is not designed to feed them. You, you have to realize your gift, think of yourself like a tree. And the Bible says that we are the trees of the Lord. We are trees of his planting. Think of yourself like a tree. How many times have you ever seen an orange tree producing orange and then the orange tree, you know, reaching its branches out and pulling the oranges into its own trunk? You know why? Because orange trees don't consume oranges. Apple trees don't consume apples. The fruit that you produce is not for you. And that's why God can use you to prophesy to somebody else when you get home and you need a word from God. That's why God can use you to heal somebody. You come home and your knees are hurting. Your feet are hurting. Your back is tired. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever wondered sometimes why God would use you to bless somebody else and then you at home sucking your thumb and <laughs> hanging onto your pillow by yourself and you wondered, God, I, you've used me to bless other people? What? Because this thing is not about you. So humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less because we are put here to serve other people. You know, when the Bible talks about the things that you will have gone through, the, how the God of all comfort comforts us in, 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 in whatever tribulation that we go through, he says he does that so that he puts us into the ministry of consolation, which is bringing comfort and cheer uh, and exhortation to others. It's not about you. It's not about you. Your gift is not about you. It's through you, but it's not about you. And pride makes it about you. So pride twists the anointing because the anointing is not about you. Whoever, uh, you know, if somebody poured some wonderful anointing oil out of, the, um, out of some golden vessel, who stops to take the time to say, oh my God, that golden vessel? No, 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 it was the anointing that came out of it. 
It was the oil. The power was, was in faith that was mixed with the oil. It had little to nothing to do with the vessel that was holding it. So we have to be able to walk in the strength of God, walk in God's strength, and allow not who we are as the vessel, it's the stuff that he puts in the vessel that is designed to serve other people. Do you realize that the anointing oil is not designed for the container that carries it? It's, that's just a holding place until it can get to its destination. And so this is what, when you deal with the spirit of pride, the spirit of pride t tries to make it about you instead of about what God put in you, what God gave to you, and what God called and anointed you to be and to do. And remember this, pride is the strength of sin. Pride is the strength of sin. When you find an old stubborn man, he won't change. His wife can't tell him anything. Ladies, keep looking forward. <laughs> there, there, there are certain people, and, and you, you're wasting your breath if you try to do it. You know why? Because pride is the strength of sin. Because, you know, men have strong egos. You know what ego is. Ego is edging God out. Edging God out. So it's all connected to pride. It's all connected to this whole spirit of Jaffa, which is pride. It has everything to do with pride. And it edges God out. And it makes everything about the person. But pride is the strength of sin. There are some people, the only reason that they won't repent is because pride. It's just pride. They've got too much pride to even admit that they were wrong. That's why, you know, back in the day before we had GPS, you know, when, when a man was trying to find a place, see, we, we wouldn't pull over and ask people. The wife was trying to tell, why don't you stop in the service station up here and ask them? Where? Oh, well, we, we'll find it. We just keep driving. I believe, I believe it's up here somewhere. We, and he, and he wouldn't even stop and ask because of pride. Pride is the strength of sin. It can keep you going in a wrong direction because you got too much pride to say, I'm lost. I don't know where in the world I am. And some men would burn two hours of gasoline <laughs> driving around because they wouldn't stop and ask. They wouldn't lower their pride. Pride is the strength of sin. Uh, pride is arrogance at its best. It's just the strength of sin. The only reason that people don't change is because they're too arrogant. Once they find out that they're wrong, they'll just be stubbornly wrong. Well, I got that's just the way I am. <laughs> just pride. It's, 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 but you know, it's like, I've always been that way. That's pride talking. Pride talking, saying, I may be wrong, but that's how I am. I'm never going to change. Pride is the strength of sin. But see, arrogance, when you have that, this arrogance, it is always a cover-up for shame or inadequacy. Arrogance is a cover-up for some kind of shame or a real deep-seated feeling of inadequacy. So when you find arrogant people, they're hiding something. Arrogant folks don't want you to, they don't want to find uh, in the Emerald City what's behind the curtain. But they know that it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors. And so the arrogance will, will say, get away from there. To speak and to do this big cover up is that you're much more than what you really are. It's to cover the shame and the inadequacy that there's just an old man behind the curtain who's been using special effects. And that's what arrogance does. Now, there are two types of pride. Number one is lofty pride. Lofty pride. There is a lofty pride. Uh, you, you understand that you've done well by the grace of God. By the grace of God. This is pride over what God has done for you and to you in you and through you. So there is a godly pride. That is a lofty pride. You know, I mean, if people, if your children do well, then other parents can have a lofty pride over their children. 
You can have a lofty pride. There is a godly pride because you're saying, look at what the Lord has done, that God has helped me. God, by his grace, by his mercy, by God breathing on me. And so there is a lofty pride to say, you know what? I am so, when I look back and just see what God has done, how he has graced my life, there's a godly pride over that. But then secondly, there is a negative degenerative pride. And this negative degenerative pride says, look what I have done. This is the kind of pride that becomes condescending toward other people. It, it looks down on other people. It puts other people down. See, there's nothing wrong with, with pulling yourself up, but there's a problem with pulling yourself up at the expense of pushing other people down. That's the problem. Uh, that This negative pride makes everything about you and never considers other people. Remember, the gift is not about you, it's really about others. It's the equipment that God has given us to be able to serve others. And if you develop your trust in the Lord, you'll be able to conquer Jaffia. See, your, your trust cannot be in your education and in your skill and in your ability and in your contacts and in your hookup and in your money and in your possessions and in all of your knowledge, it has to be in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. You don't put your trust in houses and, and land. You don't put your trust in horses and chariots. Our trust has to be in God. And trust is even beyond faith. It is beyond faith. Sometimes God will close our eyes just so that he can open our hearts. He won't even let you see something because God's trying to open up something in your heart. And you don't always have to know how God is going to do something. You just have to simply know that he's going to do it. You trust that God is going to do it. And Japhia is an anti-God because he trusts in self instead of God. It's the pride that then lifts the person up saying, look what I did. You know when God is the one who gave you the rod to turn it into a serpent. Now wouldn't that be silly if God gives you something and tells you to do something and then you do it and then you say, look what I did. No, no, no. Our pride and joy has to be in that, you know what, knowing who I am and what I am, God chose to use me anyhow. Do you realize that God trusted me with a rod and I could barely put two words together and God trusted me? To be able to demonstrate his power before the nations? And so what a privilege. I mean, see, that's taking the road of humility. It is not puffing yourself up saying, look what I did. Look what I did. Paul understood this and this is why Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. He realized, I mean, you know, that's why I am not quick to point at other people that fall, that mess up. I mean, the real Christian heart, if you see other brethren that fall, other sisters that fall, don't, don't be the one who's standing there, you know, saying, I told you so, and pointing your finger at other people. You know, if you'll be honest with yourself as we are trusting God and taking a posture of humility, you says, except for the grace of God, there goes me. That could have been me. That could have been my child. That could have been my husband. That could have been my wife, my son, my daughter. So we don't say, you know, that because we say all of our prayers and we tithe and we, we make our daily confessions and this is why none of this evil can befall my house. No, 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 no. It is by the grace of God. It is by the grace. It is by His grace. By His grace. It's not because you tried to doubt all of your I's and cross all of your T's. Listen, when the Bible speaks to us in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. But Japhia, that spirit of pride, depends on his own understanding. But seek his will in all that you do and he will show you which path to take. See, we have to depend on him because there are too many forks in the road. There are too many options. And many times all of the doors look alike. And you need guidance. God, I need you. I need you. I need your guidance in my life. I need your guidance in my life. And if you ever wondered about it, pride is manifested in, in three different areas. Pride is manifested in word. You can tell pride by the way that people talk. In their words, just listen to prideful people and, and you can tell their pride in how they talk. It's represented in spirit. 
Sometimes, you know, they don't even have to open their mouth. It's just they got the spirit of pride over them. You can just tell them where they carry themselves. It's, it's just, it's a spirit. Of, they haven't even said anything to you. But you can look at people and tell when they think they're better than you are. You can feel it. Because it is, it is discernible by spirit, not by what they said. It's just by spirit. They didn't have to tell you that they think that they are better than you. You discern by the spirit the condescension that was in the spirit of that pride. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. You, you, you get it by word. You get it by spirit. And thirdly, you get it by gesture. By gesture. That's gesticulation is what you do with your body. That's a proud look. You know, you can just tell people when they just think that they just all that. It's a gesture. It's a gesture. You can tell people when they just walk in. You know, men be, be pimping just, you, you know. <laughs> you, you can tell when a lady is walking and she just knows she looking good. She knows she looking good. She got out of her car and she knows that these men are lined up down here. She, oh, she, she don't always just sling it to the left and right all like that. She realizes she's got an audience and she knows when she is decked out and stacked up and, and walking a certain kind. She knows she doesn't walk around her house like that. And she bam, boom, bam. <laughs> She's walking and saying, I hope he's looking. I hope he is looking at me. I know, I know, I know he's looking. I better walk, I better walk. And you're praying that you don't fall, that your heel doesn't turn over. <laughs> but pride is manifested in word, in spirit, and in gesture. In word, spirit, and gesture. And, and, and the way to really effectively deal with Jaffia, the spirit of pride, is to consider yourself dead and then to put your full trust in God. Reckon yourself to be dead and put your full trust in God. Now the final challenging spirit that we deal with is Deber. Deber. And Deber means speaker. Isn't that interesting? This relationship with this speaker, Deber. He's a king of Eglon, which means circle. Circle. So if you, if you put it all together, Deborah, the king of Eglon, is one that talks in circles and speaks against the will of God. It's an enemy. Just talks in circles and then really speaking against the will of God. Uh, this is the kind of relationship that tries to talk you into what God says to stay out of. This is the kind of relationship that tries to talk you into what God says to stay out of. Now listen, you are where you are today because of the voices that you have trusted to speak into your life. And so this is why Deborah is so significant. Because Deborah is a speaker. Deborah is a speaker. And, and here's the great deception of Deborah is that Deborah always speaks in the first person to make you believe that they are your thoughts. Isn't, isn't that interesting that you got a speaker talking to you in the first person. You hear them in the first person, and so naturally you assume, hmm, wonder what made me think that. You ever had some crazy thought come across your mind, and then you, you ask yourself, hmm, wonder what made me think that. Maybe it is Deborah, this spirit here. It's a relationship. See, you've got to conquer these challenging relationships of this thing coming to your mind. I remember years ago, I was teaching the Bible back in the 70s. And this lady said to me that a voice came to her and told her to kill somebody. The voice said, you know, I knew who the speaker was. I knew who the speaker was. You'd be surprised how when individuals do that. And I remember a young lady called me one time. She had gotten away with murder, literally. Literally. She had gotten away with murder. And it was eating her soul out. And she couldn't sleep. And she had to confess and she called me. She said, I killed my boyfriend. 
She told me where it was done, how it was done. And she said, I hadn't been able to sleep afterwards. I hadn't been able to sleep. It's amazing that how a person will act on something that a voice told them and not even understand who the author is. You see, you are where you are today because of the voices that you trusted to speak into your life. Some people, the voices might have been some older folks that were hanging around them that groomed them into devil, devilish behavior, mannish kind of stuff, that talked them into it. You know how men, they, they, can, they can pressure, there's a peer pressure in young, young guys trying to impress slightly older guys, and, and they'll make him feel, you know, oh man, you ain't gonna be no punk, are you? Come on, you go. And they talk them into something. This is Deborah trying to talk you into what God says to stay out of. This is Deborah. This is Deborah. And uh, the great deception, again, is that he will speak to you in the first person. And so Deborah is that voice that tries to change who you are and what you are. He's got, a, he's got a goal. There is a motive. He's trying to change who you are and what you are. And so he throws doubt into your mind about what God uh, will do on your behalf. And let, let me just say this to you, that whenever your mind becomes filled with doubt, go to the Word of God. Because the Word will bring you clarity. Whenever your mind becomes filled with doubt, go to the Word. Go to the Word of God. Go to the Word of God. Get on your knees. Whenever you are filled with doubt, search it out in the Word. The Word brings clarity. The Word brings clarity. And so remember Deborah now because Deborah is speaking to you in the first person. He's always speaking in the first person. Uh, he'll say things uh, to to you like this, you know, nobody will ever love me. Ain't nobody going to ever love me. He put that thought in your mind and then make you think it. And then you take ownership of it. He'll say it this way. I'm too old. I'm too old for that. He'll tell another young person, I'm too young. I'm too young. I mean, he, he gave that to Jeremiah. I'm too young. I don't have enough experience. I mean, you just start putting stuff. I'm dumb. I always do stupid things. Just start talking in the first person. I'll never have a baby. I'll never get married. I'm not attractive enough. I'm always messing up everything that I get. I'll never be able to keep any money. And he starts speaking these thoughts one after another, after another, after another. And guess what happens that a repeated lie becomes believed after a while. If you lie to yourself enough, you'll start believing it, even though it may not have any basis in reality. It may not have any basis in reality. People that commit suicide, you know that there's some little voice in their head that's to kill yourself. You ought to just kill yourself. You ought to just end it all. You ought to just end it all. And don't ever think that that's just a little phase and it's gonna pass away. Because I, I don't know whether you realize it or not, but in this nation, suicide is probably the second largest killer between young people the ages of 12 to 25 years old. So there are a lot of people that's hearing that and responding to it. Kill yourself. Kill yourself. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself. They found one young man who committed suicide and sitting in his truck, in his CD player, was the song Suicide Solution that he had been listening to over and over. Deborah, programming his mind, speaking. You've got to watch who is the Deborah that's on the other side of your child's cell phone. Who is the Deborah on the other side of the chat on the internet? Who? Who is that voice? Who? Because the voices that you trust. Come here, baby. Come here. I ain't going to do nothing to you. Can't. you we, we, we wind up in, in deep voodoo because of the voices that we trust. 
And you can't stop Deborah from speaking to you, but you can talk back. You can talk back. And much of our talking back is actually for our benefit so that, um, that we will know the truth and let that truth that we know make us free. We need to talk back to, the, to Deborah for our own benefit. For our own benefit, reminding us of the truth. That no, 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 this is not me. No, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I mean, we, we have to start speaking to, 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 to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. I mean, when the devil tells you nobody wants you, you have to start saying, I am the apple of God's eye. Uh, his eye, somebody does want me. His eye is on me and he is covering me. He is blessing me. He knows that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, you have to start confessing. That's what I'm saying. Whenever you're in doubt, look to the word. Look to the word. The word brings clarity. The word brings clarity. And remember that Deborah is in your head, but the Holy Spirit is in your heart. He's in your heart. And your heart knows things that your head never does know and never will know. And so the best way to deal with the spirit of Deborah is to become a speaker yourself, a speaker of the word of God. You become a speaker yourself. When you're dealing with a voice that's talking to you, don't be the victim. You got a negative limiting thought that comes to your mind, put an empowering thought there. Bring a scripture there. Bring a, 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 an affirmation. Bring a positive confession empowered and based upon biblical principles and speak that out. Speak that out. Don't just be the victim sitting there and allowing that to then become your inner voice. You have to actually talk back. Don't sit in silence. They could be saying things on the outside, but if you get fired, just have, you got to have that conversation all on your inside just to keep, keep your own sanity. You know, if somebody, you know, if they're calling you stupid, you know, you got to say in your mind, and you can, I know you can lose your job over it, but you got to say, I'll show you stupid. I, I mean, you got to say that inside. You, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you, there are certain things in order to keep your sanity. You, you, you've got to be able to, to, to speak, but don't sit there and listen without your becoming a speaker. So whenever the devil starts making noise, you got to make more noise. You got to turn your volume up. Turn your volume up. Don't let him drown you out with satanic stuff. You know, now I don't know how true this is, but you know, they said that, you know, the rock group Kiss, they said that it stood for king in satanic sound. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. But whenever you are hearing satanic sound, you have to pump up your volume and, and produce God's sound. Pump up the volume. Pump up the volume. I mean, have you ever thought about the fact that the serpent in the Garden of Eden would have been powerless had he never opened his mouth? I want you to notice that in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 in the English Standard Version. Notice this. Now the serpent was more crafty, more subtle than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now see, you remember, see, he had a voice, he could talk. Did God actually say you should not eat of, the, the, of any tree in the garden? Making them question. That's why I said, if you have a question, go back to the word. Whenever you have doubt, go back to the word. The devil threw doubt in her mind. Notice, he said to the woman, he had a voice, and he said something to her. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. Die, surely die. You will not surely die. <laughs> For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. <laughs> He's having a conversation with Deber, devil, Deber. He's having a conversation. And you see, her destiny was impacted because of the voice that she trusted. 
she listened and obeyed his voice. And that's why one of the curses that came upon the serpent was that his voice was taken away. And I don't know whether you realize it or not, the serpent, snakes are the most feared of species. I mean, we don't, we, you know, we don't fool with snakes. Now, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I can deal with spiders and bugs and other things, but I, I ain't going to fool with no snake. I don't want to fool with that. You know, we, we don't fool with snakes. I mean, we'll deal with a, with a ferocious dog and coyotes and wolves or whatever, but you know, a, a snake, if a snake is in the house, they can have a house. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm coming out of there. I'm coming out of there. And I'm not going back in there until somebody has gone in there and has shown me what they brought out. <laughs> I never will forget, I was down in Costa Rica. And I was talking with a lady, uh, you know, and she'd, she'd stayed in this place. She's trying to be creative and adventurous and all of that. She stayed up in the jungle. I visited the jungle and took a mud bath and all of that kind of stuff. But she stayed in the resort there. This, this Caucasian lady, she, she said to me, she said, I, I, I'll never be back here. Because when she, she was awakened in the night, something moved her pillow. I said, what was it? She said it was a boa constrictor. And she jumped up out of the bed. And she opened the door. She opened the door a series of tarantulas were hanging. She took off running down the, the hall and went to the manager's office. And I said, what happened next? <laughs> well, she said, because the place was at capacity, they couldn't move her to another room. So the manager comes back to the room, <laughs> back to her room, Searches the room thoroughly for the snake. Couldn't find the snake. Now they're at capacity. There's no other room that they can move her to. It's the middle of the night. She's in the jungle. I said, I bet you stayed up the rest of the night, didn't you? <laughs> she said, you got that right. <laughs> You know why? Because we don't fool with snakes. We don't fool with snakes. But this very snake that she was afraid of didn't have a voice. He couldn't growl. <clears throat> couldn't growl. He couldn't do that. I mean, it, it, only thing that they can do is pass air through to make the hissing sound. Psst, psst. But they have no voice. God took it. He took the voice. It's one of the judgments against the serpent. Prior to that, the serpent had been talking his head off, explaining all kinds of things. But I want you to notice Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 23 in the English Standard Version. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. You see, Deborah is so dangerous. Uh, even James chapter 1 verse 9 reminds us, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. I want you to understand the process of that. You do understand the difference between wrath and anger. Wrath is the expression of anger. Anger is an emotion. Wrath is an act. It is an act. A woman gets mad out of her anger. She slaps. The slap is a wrath. That's wrath. Anger is the emotion. But I want you to notice the order here. Swift to hear. Be quick to hear. Slow to speak. And slow to wrath. In that order. Because they know that most people do it just in the opposite direction. They are quick to wrath. I mean, you say something... They're quick to wrath, quick to speak, and slow to hear. And the biblical instruction, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to act on your anger.
slow, slow. Now, here are five things that Deborah does when he speaks. He infuses doubt and questions truth. You notice what he did with Eve. Infuses doubt. Has God not said? He infuses doubt and questions truth. Number two, he confuses identity. He confuses identity. He, he made her feel as though she couldn't do something that she already could do. He says when you partake of this fruit, you're going to be like God. She was already like him. She was made in his image. After his likeness, she was already like him. But he confused her identity. So he made her think that she had to get something in order to be like him. She was already like him. Listen, before the devil can ever get you to misbehave, he must confuse your identity. He must make you forget who you are. He must make you forget that you're a child of God. He must make you forget. I'm telling you, when people are sinning, they're not thinking about I'm deacon, I'm elder, I'm reverend so-and-so, I'm bishop. So when they sin, they, are, they do not want that identity. They forget that identity. Here's the third thing. Espouses contrary doctrine. Espouses contrary doctrine. He lied to Eve. He espoused a contrary doctor. You will not surely die. God had already told you. You eat it, you die. No questions asked. There was nothing to be confused about. You eat it, you die. There were no questions. He espouses contrary doctrine. Number four, uh, he deceives. Deceives. He deceived Eve. He deceived her. He tricked her. And number five, he breeds rebellion. Breeds rebellion. These are five things that Deborah does when he speaks. Now I want you to notice this. Because words are like seeds. You know, when you speak words, you're planting seeds. When you speak words, you're planting seeds almost like in the garden of somebody's mind. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 says this, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put a man whom he had formed. Now I want you to notice this, that God planted a garden as opposed to speaking it into existence. I want you to notice that. God planted a garden. He planted it. He planted it. He had to plant all of the trees. God planted a garden. And it's the example of how we are made. We're made in the image of God. We have to plant what we intend to reap. He didn't just speak it into the existence. It wasn't just name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. God rolled up his sleeves. God planted. He planted. There were other things that he spoke into existence. Let there be light. Pow. He spoke it, but when God wanted something that was going to reproduce after its kind, he had to create the seed and plant the seed and it reproduced after its kind. So when you want to produce something that's going to keep on producing it, you have to plant it and not speak it. So if a man wants a child, he must plant it. He can't just speak it. He has to plant it. There are some things that are designed for the productivity in the earth that must be planted. If God had to plant it and couldn't speak it, how much more do you have to plant things that you might have been trying to speak into existence? There are some things. You plant a church. You plant a business. You plant a family. You plant an idea. There are certain things that you have to plant and you can't just speak. You have to plant it. You have to plant it. You have to plant it. And so what people uh, say has no bearing on what God has planted in you. What people say about you has no bearing on what God has planted in you. Now let me say this to you. There are some things that are in you that will not bloom until a certain amount of time has passed. And the devil can make you think that you are barren and don't have anything in you. But remember, God has planted some stuff. He has buried treasure in you. It's planted in you. And whatever is planted when the water comes is coming back up. It's coming back up. 
He has planted certain things in you. It's hidden in you. It's planted in you. And there are certain things that will not bloom until the season is right. And, and the devil can make you think that you're, that you're just empty. That your life is void. And I wonder why I can't get anything to work for me. You see, when a little girl is born, a little girl has all of the eggs in her ovaries that she will ever have. She doesn't manufacture eggs. A little girl is born with all of the, ov uh, the eggs that she'll ever have already in both ovaries. She doesn't manufacture eggs. But what happens is that when she reaches around 11 or 12 years old, the eggs that God planted start maturing. And every month, of the right ovary will release an egg one month and the left ovary will release an egg the next month. And they alternate back and forth in a season and a process and is, is waiting for a seed to be planted for conception to take place. And it, wouldn't it be amazing if, if you were, because uh, you, you've been holding out for five years and you think that your eggs ought to be mature but they're not? There's some thing that God has planted in you that will not manifest until the fullness of time. The fullness of time. And when the fullness of time comes, the thing matures and bam, God will bring it. You don't want God to bring you a blessing that you are not mature enough to, to sustain. It's one thing to play with a baby doll. It's another thing to have a baby. And have to feed that child and help that child with homework and sit up with a sick child and take them to doctor's appointments and take them to, to practice and pick them up for sports and to pick them up after school and to help them, you know, with, with their projects and, 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 and give them lunch money and to take them shopping and to do this for Christmas. And to, you don't do all of that with a baby doll. And there are some things that you might think that you're a little mama. But you don't really want a baby because you're not prepared to be a mama yet. And so God won't even let certain things start dropping for you until a certain maturity in the spirit. You have to understand that in the spirit realm, there are some things that God is just waiting on you to get ready. You think you're waiting on God, but God says, I'm waiting on you to grow up because what I would have blessed you with. If I were to give it to you right now, your back is not strong enough. This blessing would break your back right now. You're not even ready. If I brought you the husband right now with your mouth, you would run him off. Oh, he's trying. I'm just telling you. I'm just, there's some thing that God says, I got to put you in check. I got to grow you up. I, I, there's some things I got to purge out of you. There's some other thing that I've got to develop in you. But because I don't want you to corrupt the blessing that I'm going to bring into you. So I'm, I'm going to wait until you can be mature enough to where you realize you don't have to speak everything that you think. And, and I want you to know that this is not about you, that you've got to be able to love beyond what you can see. You've got to be able to say, you know what, this is not the ideal, but I'm still going to love it because I see the ideal in there. And I'm going to love you until you come into that position. But it takes maturity, a whole lot of maturity, to be able to treat a person as though they already were that. To call those things that be not, even as though they were, to say that they are your king, your, your knight, and your shining armor. To say that this is my queen. It takes a lot of maturity to be able to encourage people who are still developing, who are still making mistakes. You know, so that you don't corrupt the blessing that God is trying to send you. There are certain things that he has a time for a certain age. And so God will plant things in you before you need them. And then he will allow them to mature over time. But character and honor, they must be forged. You can't just speak them into existence. They must be forged. That's why Adam had to work the garden. You can't just speak to it. You have to work it. You have to forge character. And there's a character that is built in, in that whole working the garden. Character and honor must be forged. And so we should sometimes hold off even praying the prayer of Jabez. Oh God, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. The reason that I'm saying that you ought to delay praying the prayer of Jabez is because Jabez prayed that prayer. The Bible says that Jabez was more honorable than all of his brothers. Jabez was a man of honor. Why would God want to bless a dishonorable man? 
And so until you have sown the seeds of honor, until you have sown the seeds of honor, don't ask God to bless your field. Because it is like asking God to bless a field in which there is no seed. And if he does bless a field that has no seed, nothing still will be produced. Because harvest is always the result of what has been planted. One plants, another waters, and then God gives the increase. Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. Why have we coveted the blessing of Jabez and we have not coveted his honor? And the honor is built by rolling up your sleeves and working in that garden, sometimes getting your hands dirty, taking out the trash, time to make the donuts, serving others, running the vacuum cleaner, washing and helping to serve other sick people. This thing is a test of your real character. And when you have proven your honor, then is the time to say, God, now bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. But if I hadn't been doing anything with the territory that he's already been giving me, there's no need for him to enlarge it. But Jabez was an honorable man. He was more honorable than his brethren. And so the seeds of honor were already sown in his life. And now all he needed was God to bless him, to reign on his field. And may I tell you that it, the reason that it doesn't rain in the desert is because there's no seed there. The seed summons the rain. Your seed summons the rain. Your seed summons the rain. And I love it how in, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus has been tempted by the devil, he finally shut Satan up because Satan kept telling him, it is written, it is written, it is written. And finally Jesus said, it is said. <laughs> because you see, the devil could tell Jesus what was written, but Jesus had a pipeline to his father. Jesus could tell him what was said. And God gave him a rhema of word. And when he gave him that rhema of word, it shut the devil up. And so we have to learn how to deal with these uh, opposing forces of the devil by discovering how Joshua dealt with these five difficult, challenging relationships. Here they are quickly. Here's what we learn from how Joshua dealt with the kings. Number one, you have to locate and confine them. To bind them. You have to bind them. Locate them and bind them. You got enemies. Uh, that means that you need to locate them. And that means that you need to confine them. You need to limit their influence in your life. You locate them, identify them, and confine how much time you spend with them. You have to locate them and bind them. Limit their influence in your world. Locate them and confine them. And uh, secondly, don't let what you haven't conquered keep you from conquering what you can. Because they conquered the king, but they hadn't finished all of their lands. And so don't let what you haven't conquered keep you from conquering what you can. Here's the third thing that we learn. You put their, uh, your feet on their neck. In other words, subdue them. You have to subdue them. That means that they have to be under control. These challenging relationships must be under control. They can't get the best of you. They must be subdued. Number four, you, you kill them and hang them as trophies. That's what they did with all five of those kings. They killed them and then they buried them in caves, in a cave and put a stone there. Uh, you kill them and then you hang them as trophies. Now, I'm not talking about literally going out and killing anybody, but you kill their influence over you. You know how when people are, are, are challenging to you and they, they, they can hurt you? There are some really insensitive people in the world and they will say things with that sword that's in their mouth and cut you and leave you bleeding. But you know, when you kill them in terms of killing the influence, it means now they can say nasty things to you and you can, you can smile and go right to sleep. I mean, it used to be that they'd say something, you'd be crying for three days. And now they say those same things to you, but you've killed their influence because you expect it out of them. And so you don't allow it to poison you, to mess up your day, to destroy who you are on the inside. So you have to kill their influence. That's what killing that spirit is. It's about saying, you will no longer lord it over me. I'm, I'm, I'm killing your influence. You don't matter to me like that anymore. I'm not going to stay up 
over that and be crying for days. And here's number five, lay them to rest. In other words, bring, bring closure, bring closure, lay it to rest. And they, they buried them in a cave, they, they sealed it, they sealed it off. You have to bring closure to things that are no longer life-giving to you, but have been destructive. You have to seal that thing off to say, you know what? I can't stop you, but you know what? I'm going to reckon as though you are already dead. You seal it off. You bring closure to that thing in your own heart and mind. And, and pray for your enemies. Pray for them. Pray for them and watch God do something exceptional. I hope that you got something out of this series that <laughs> ministers life to you. Thank God for his word. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.